And may I welcome you warmly to St. Helens this morning. Where and how do we encounter and experience the glory of God? That's the question we're going to be considering this morning. Where and how do we encounter and experience the glory of God? The imam in his minaret is summoning us to engage with the glory of God. The guru in his temple is preoccupied with the glory of God. The cardinal in his cathedral seeks the glory of God. The mover and shaker in his megachurch is concerned with the glory of God. But where and how do we encounter and experience God's glory? And I want us to see from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that it is in and through the open proclamation of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit of God that we encounter God's glory. If you want to experience God in all his glory, it is to be found in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. If you want to engage in the work of God in all its glory, Jesus, as he is proclaimed, is where it is found. God's glory today is tied inextricably to the proclamation of Jesus of Nazareth by the power of his Holy Spirit. As we speak of Jesus, as we think of Jesus, as we encounter Jesus, as we proclaim Jesus, so we are dealing, if you like, in the currency of the glory of God. This means that every single one of us in this building today has personal access to and involvement in an experience of God and his glory in all its fullness here on June the 9th, 2019. It may not look particularly impressive, it may not feel all that powerful, but this is where the action is, this is where God's glory is encountered, this is the ministry of glory, the proclamation of Jesus Christ, gloryministries.com. Now over the last three weeks we've been considering, considering genuine Christian ministry, what is the real McCoy when it comes to authentic Christian ministry? And the Apostle Paul sees himself as part of a triumphal procession at the head of which is the risen and ascended Lord Jesus as his gospel message is spread across the world. Paul is a slave, a sacrifice, a spokesman in this triumphal procession. And we've seen that Paul's aim is not simply about himself as part of that procession, but also for each and every one of us here today, every one of his readers, that they understand that proclaiming Jesus Christ is where the action is, authentic Christian ministry, gloryministries.com, such that his readers engage in that ministry, become part of that triumphal procession. And so I printed at the top of our sheet the key verse, really, for the whole of 2 Corinthians, where Paul says, we're not commending ourselves to you again. You'll have a, 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 an outline inside your notice sheet there. Paul says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, that is, to rejoice in us, to exult in us and our ministry, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, literally what's simply on the face rather than what's in the heart. And Paul is very clear that there are forms of Christian ministry, forms of ministry generally, that are simply on the surface, on the face, they don't penetrate. And that if you and I want to be involved in gloryministries.com, to line up with gloryministries.com, something that really penetrates to the heart, then we need to be engaged in the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord. And from our passage, you can see that the particular on-the-face ministry that Paul is concerned to counter is one that dealt purely with Old Testament religion. And so there's talk of Moses and of the law and of the Old Covenant. And Paul is saying, no, 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 there's been a whole new era that has been introduced. 
The old covenant, the law, you know, it's not permanent. It's passing away. It's gone. It's done and dusted now. The action now is in the new covenant ministry of the Spirit. If you want to be involved in gloryministries.com, the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about the old covenant and how it came, it looked hugely impressive. If you've been there at the mountain back in the book of Exodus, you know, the thunder, the lightning, the thick clouds, the trembling mountain, the institutions, the temple, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the royal throne, the festivals, the morality, the acceptability of the whole old covenant ministry. It was all so impressive. And Paul says, yes, but it didn't penetrate to the heart. And now that Jesus has come, there is a ministry that radically changes human hearts. And if you're involved in the proclamation of Jesus, however impressive the old covenant ministry looked, you're now involved in something more powerful, more impressive, and more enduring. Now, here is the Apostle Paul. And in chapter 3, he outlines for us really the theological heart of the letter, and we've mentioned that a couple of times. And uh, we've dealt with already that the ministry of the new covenant changes hearts. That's verses 1 to 6, but it's worth a tiny bit of revision there. And if you have a look at verse 6, you can see Paul's point. He has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You look at the end of verse 3, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. We dealt with this last week. The proclamation of Jesus Christ is the ministry of glory because in it, hearts are changed. Hearts are regenerated is the technical language for it. The ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of Christ, is the ministry of regeneration. And we went back last week and we looked at the prophet Ezekiel and how he promised a day when uh, our sins would be washed away, where our stone hearts, unresponsive to God, would be given a heart transplant and we'd be given a pumping heart of flesh and where God's Holy Spirit would come into our lives and make us new. Paul says, with the coming of Jesus, that day has come. And so as we proclaim Jesus Christ across the world, hearts are being changed. A, a kind of silent, almost secret spiritual surgery is going on. As the cross and death of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, People turn to Jesus, their sins are washed clean, a new heart is given, pumping, alive to God, and God places his Holy Spirit within us. It's quite a thought, isn't it? You, know, you don't have to have been to seminary to be engaged in glory ministries. You don't have to have letters and titles before or after your name to be engaged in glory ministries. You don't have to wear a dog collar or robes to be engaged in glory ministries. You can be a five-year-old on his first day at school and you can be engaged in glory ministries as you mention Jesus Christ and speak of the cross and hearts are changed. You can be an 85-year-old heading out to the shops on your Zimmer and you can speak of Jesus Christ and people can have Jesus proclaimed to them. Hearts changed, new life, the ministry written on the heart. It's wonderful, isn't it? gloryministries.com. But in verses 7 to 11, he goes on to explain in a little more detail how this happens. And verses 7 to 11 tell us that sins are forgiven in this proclamation of Jesus Christ because the proclamation of Jesus Christ is the ministry of glory, for in it and through it, people are made right with God. And that's something that the Old Testament ministry simply could not achieve. It pointed to it, but it couldn't actually achieve it. So let's have a look at verses 7 to 11 in a little detail. If the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, that's the Old Covenant ministry, came with such glory that Israelites couldn't gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? 
For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness or justification must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For in what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Glory, 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 glory. Ten times he mentions it, doesn't he? If you were an English uh, essay marker, you would be circling it in red. For all its glory, ultimately, at the end of the day, Old Testament covenant with Moses could not actually deliver on making a person right with God. And that's Paul's point in verses 7 to 11. Yes, it came with glory. And the law really is glorious. As we ponder it for, for just a moment, it's glorious in its moral purity. And it's glorious in its judicial demands. Glorious in its moral purity. Glory in its demand for judgment. And so you think about the first four of the Ten Commandments and, and the glory of this relationship with the one true God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not create a graven image. You shall not take my name in vain. Keep the Sabbath glorious as the one true God and a proper relationship with him is established and everything else is scattered to the winds. Glorious as people recognize the creator of the universe as the only true God. And then think of the next six commandments and think of the glory of the horizontal demands, if you like. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. It, it, it is glorious as Families are established and order is settled. Think of the glory of a culture in which fathers and mothers are honored and the marriage bed is kept pure and envy and greed is looked down upon as being morally wrong. It's glorious. And then think of the glory of its judicial demands. I shall by no means acquit the guilty. Isn't that a glorious thing? That the guilty will not go unpunished. Isn't that wonderful? That we should have justice and that right punishment for sin is installed. Is that not an absolutely glorious thing? And yet, even as we hold up the glory of the law and the Ten Commandments, we begin to see that this ministry of glory is a ministry of condemnation. I begin to think, well, I have broken the first four commandments. I certainly have, and so have you. And not only that, I've broken each one of the second six commandments. I've not honored, honored my father and mother as I should. I've not thought of my wife as I should all the time. I, I have envied, and I have thought rotten thoughts about other people, and so have you. And so even as we hold up this ministry, this glorious ministry, condemnation, 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 you are in the dock and you're as guilty as I am. So for all its glory, it's a ministry of condemnation and death. I shall by no means acquit the guilty. You're condemned. Come and see me if you think you've caught, kept the Ten Commandments perfectly and I will direct you in the direction of one or two of our kind of um, people who help with people's psychological well-being. Come and see me if you think you've kept them. You haven't. And because you haven't, therefore you stand condemned. And because we stand condemned, therefore we face judgment. And the penalty for sin is death. And so for all its glory, this ministry of the old covenant is a ministry of condemnation and a ministry of punishment and death. Now look at Paul's reasoning in verse 9. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, brackets, and death, 
then the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. You see, in and through the perfect life of Jesus Christ, who never sinned once, and in and through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross, who carry God's judgment at your sin, as we come to the Lord Jesus and put our trust in him and if you like, appropriate his death on our behalf and shelter under his sacrificial death, so God declares us to be right in his sight. And now this ministry, making us right with God, with the punishment paid and sin dealt with, is far, far more glory, glorious than the ministry of the old covenant. God's forgiveness, washing clean, clothing, acquitting. What a glorious ministry. Now, I've tried to represent this in the diagram on your sheet there, under point two. Really, I think we should have a cross under where it has the HS in the heart. But God the Father sending God the Son, who dies the death to carry his judgment at our sin, then with the Holy Spirit carrying that across into our heart, leaves you and me if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, right before God. What a glorious ministry. I remember somebody standing up here on a Sunday morning and uh, reading a verse along the lines that God declares us right with God as we put our trust in Jesus Christ, pausing and then saying, if you trust Jesus this morning... God now sees you as perfect as a result of what Jesus has done. That's remarkable, isn't it? And glorious, and glorious. Think of your life. Think of just this week. Think perhaps just of this morning. If you trust Jesus Christ today, no matter what you've done, where you've been, how you've behaved, God now sees you as perfect. So condemnation dealt with. Death dealt with. The death of Jesus on the cross on my behalf, a ministry of righteousness, declaring us right with God as the Holy Spirit carries this truth and implants it in our heart. What a glorious ministry. Now can you see how it is that as we engage in the ministry of Jesus Christ, proclaiming him and his royal rule, his sacrificial death, so we are engaged in the currency of God's glory. Gloryministries.com. Very early this morning, uh, a van drew up outside St. Helens and an individual got out of it who I didn't initially recognize. I used to know him before he was married. He always used to turn up unshaven, shorts, you know, T-shirt or something like this. Guy was perfectly shaven, wearing a collar on his shirt, long trousers. It was Jonathan Carswell. Uh, with 10 of those when I looked a little bit more closely. And I thought to myself, as I was uh, putting the finishing touches to this sermon, I thought to myself, I wonder what it was like for Jonathan as he packed up his van last night, drove all the way down to, to London, as he got up at six o'clock this morning, whatever time he was up to be in here in time uh, uh, for, for seven o'clock or whatever, and as he then parked his van and then unloaded it all and all the rest of it, you know, hard work, sweat, uh, what's it all worth? gloryministries.com. <laughs> Somebody takes one of those books and reads it and encounters Jesus Christ and begins to realize that in Christ, I am right with God. There is no condemnation. I'm now alive to God. I have a new heart. Glory Ministries, no matter what it feels like. Glory Ministries. I bumped into all the Sunday school leaders coming in and going about their business finishing off their visual aids, and I don't know what's going on in the Sunday school. I remember trying to teach in the Sunday school myself a number of years ago. It was absolutely calamitous and disastrous and a complete failure as, I, as far as I can remember. I don't believe anybody probably remembered a thing of what I was saying, but there they all are. And I said to them, just as I was passing, gloryministries.com. I think they slightly thought I'd lost my marbles. But there they are, as they teach the Lord Jesus Christ to those children, this is where the glory of God is encountered. Because in and through this ministry, hearts are made new. Men and women are declared right with God. This is the location of God's glory here and today. 
But Paul takes it further than that, and I'm wanting to sort of complete the whole chapter today, and you'll see in the following verses, verses 12 through 17, that it is in and through the work of Jesus Christ and his proclamation that eyes are opened, not only hearts changed, not only the people made right with God, but also eyes open to see God clearly. And in verses 12 through 17, Paul refers both to the specific incident when Moses came down the mountain carrying the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, and to the regular event that we read of in our first reading when Moses entered day by day into the presence of God. So look at verses 12 through 17. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. That word very bold means bold to speak. We don't keep quiet. We speak about it. Nobody can silence us because we have this wonderful hope. Since we have such a hope, we're very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened for this day, to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Now, this is a little bit technical, so let me try and spell it out. On both of the occasions, as Moses met with God, his face shone. Do you remember the reading we had? Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Because Moses' face shone with the glory of God, and because of God's holiness and demand for judgment, because of his people's terror, therefore Moses covered his face with a veil. Moses was therefore unable fully to disclose all the glory that he had experienced. There's a veil now over his face. He was cautious, you might say, reluctant, coy even, shy, because of the terror of the Israelites, the glory of God shining out, which petrified them with their hearts unforgiven. And because the people were so terrified of the glory of God, because of their guilt and of God's justice, so they were unable to look on Moses' face. And, and Paul puts it very bluntly, doesn't it? He, in verse 14, their minds were hardened. And verse 15, a veil lays, lies over their hearts. So resistant, their minds were hardened. Ignorant, their hearts were veiled. Yes, because with sin unforgiven, how dare I look on the glory of God? It just makes me feel guilty. And the more I glance the glory of God, the more guilty I feel. Here then is the fundamental reality of the human condition. Without forgiveness of sins, well, we're in the dark. We're blind. We're unable to look on the glory of God. And without God's forgiveness, we're reluctant to engage in any coming close to God, because simply we will be more and more exposed for what we are. The reason we're so reluctant, the reason we're so blind is because our sins are unforgiven. You know, why is it that my friends won't engage in contemplation of the reality of God? Oh, because I'm resistant. I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to come out into the light. I don't want to have to see what I'm really like. Resistant and ignorant. It's too dangerous, if you like, to lift the lid. Much better just to leave it closed. But now, with the possibility of forgiveness, as Paul proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ, so he offers not only a full revelation of God's glory, but also forgiveness. And so now it's safe to come out into the open, isn't it? Because as Jesus is proclaimed, we're not only seeing the glory of God with all the glory of God's holy law, but also the glory of forgiveness. And so I can speak open to you, openly to you this morning about Jesus Christ and God's glory, because at the same time as I talk about his moral purity, I'm also saying, look, forgiveness is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Come to him. And as I come to him for forgiveness... The veil is removed. The eyes of the heart are opened. 
and now I can gaze on the glory of God fully and freely. I can come out of prison and into the light because Jesus is being declared. Oh, glorious gospel ministry. It is glorious, isn't it? And so Paul says, we're very bold to speak. We won't keep quiet. We're not shy like Moses was. We don't put a veil over anything. We lay it out in the open, gloryministries.com. I remember my dad, uh, about 10 years before he, was, uh, before he died, went into hospital, have his cataracts removed. You may have had that experience. Actually, he said to me, uh, when he came out of hospital, and as his eyes began to clear after the cataracts were removed, he'd, he'd not really been able to see very clearly for about the last five to 10 years. He said, I looked in the mirror. I just didn't recognize the person in the mirror because I hadn't seen that person for 10 years, and I couldn't believe the damage that had taken place over the last 10 years. And it was rather a shocking sight. But as Jesus Christ is proclaimed, it's almost as if not only are hearts being made new and people made right with God, but spiritual surgery is happening on the eyes of our hearts. Cataracts are being taken away. And men and women are able to see God, not only realizing what we're like, but also that he's full of grace and love and forgiveness and willing to wash us clean gloriousministries.com. Isn't that something you long to be involved in? And if you've got the good news of Jesus, then you are involved in it. Now just contrast that for a moment with other ministries that claim to deal in the currency of glory. You know, on the face of it, you know, the pilgrimages of Islam, the, the Eid festival and so forth, the Ramadan, it all looks kind of, in a sense, glorious. It looks so impressive on the face. It can't actually achieve anything. You speak to your Muslim friends about forgiveness. No, they never feel forgiven. They never get a sense of forgiveness. And so all the fasting at Ramadan, all the pilgrimages and celebrations of Eid and all the rest of it, they're simply on the face of it and they don't actually achieve anything. They're not on the heart ministry. On the face of it, the festivals of the Hindu faith, you know, you'll hear the BBC correspondents talking about it in hushed whispers and how glorious it is. I mean, it's rank paganism. It's pretty barbaric, actually. But on the face of it, some people seem to think it's quite glorious, but it doesn't actually wreak any change in people's hearts doesn't bring about people being made right with God. It doesn't open people's eyes to see the glory of God. Quite the reverse. But if you line up with this gospel ministry, why you're involved in something that we're involved in, something that changes people's hearts, makes people right with God, enables people to see God clearly, and verse 18 transforms lives. Have a look at verse 18. And we all now with unveiled faces, the veil's been taken off in Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord, or if you look down at the footnote, reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So here is authentic, Spirit-filled ministry. It's the ministry of God the Father, God the Son, crucified and risen, written on the heart by God the Holy Spirit. I've tried to um, give something of a representation of this under point four, you see. Now we've had God the Holy Spirit apply the death of Jesus on the cross to our hearts, we're right with God. Right with God, we can now gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ. The veil has been removed. But as we gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ, his goodness, his perfection, his moral purity, his spiritual integrity, as we gaze on him, even as we gaze on him, we begin to reflect his glory now, I tried many years ago to, to work out what was going on in verse 18. It has something to do, those of you who are boffins on grammar, it has something to do whether the, 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 
the verb is the middle or, um, or something else when it comes to the mood of the verb. And uh, how does it work that we reflect the glory of God? So I took a mirror and went into the front room of our house. So I think it's around the back actually because that was south facing. And I tried to look at the sun in the mirror. Have you ever tried to do that? I didn't have a pair of those special glasses, so I nearly blinded myself, but there we are. And uh, if, if you were walking past the house at that moment and saw me gazing myself in the mirror, then you've had a very bad image of me for the last 20 years or so. But there was the sun reflecting in the mirror. And as you look at the mirror, of course, you see something of the glory of the sun. But even as you gaze on the glory of the sun, S-U-N, in the mirror, so your face shines, you're, you're lit up, you are to some degree transformed. And I think that's what's going on here. See, with the veil removed, with a heart made new, being declared right with God, unafraid to come out in the open, free to gaze on God, as I gaze on the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, his love, his goodness, his purity, his kindness, his empathy, his self-control, as I gaze on him, so I am being transformed. Oh, glorious ministry of God. New heart, eyes opened, right with God, free to look on Christ and the glory of God as I gaze on him. I am being transformed. Notice we are being transformed. We're not there yet. It's a process. It's a lifetime. Notice we are being transformed. It's something that happens to us. It's not all my effort, my hard work. Notice beholding the glory of God. It just doesn't happen automatically. It's as I gaze on Christ, so I am transformed. And notice from one degree of glory to another you haven't even begun when we get to the new creation. We will be totally transformed. It will be glorious. Well, we must draw to a close. The longer we go on in the Christian life, the more we will discover nonsense spoken, spoken about the work of God the Holy Spirit. The longer we go on in the Christian life, the more we will discover nonsense spoken about work, the work of God the Holy Spirit. In all of the New Testament, this chapter is amongst the clearest definitions of the authentic work of God, the Holy Spirit. You'll be hard pushed to find another chapter that is as comprehensive in its teaching about God, the Holy Spirit. It is the glorious ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, to have us gaze on the person of Jesus Christ, to apply the work of Jesus Christ to our hearts. It is the glorious ministry of God the Holy Spirit to point us to Jesus, so that as free now, with eyes opened, we gaze on him, God the Holy Spirit begins to transform our lives. This ministry takes place not primarily through emotions generated in the big top. This ministry takes place not through mystical experiences in cathedrals or equally mystical experiences in so-called evangelical churches that have the eight-piece band and want to make us all feel gooey inside. This ministry of the Holy Spirit takes place not as I go up on the holy mountain or into a special building or with the organ and trumpets and the assembled choirs that makes me feel all special. This ministry of the Holy Spirit happens as you and I proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Maybe one-to-one, -one, perhaps in the Sunday school, possibly at a dialogue event, Maybe as we lead a small group that, you know, there are only three or four people in it, but week by week we point them to Jesus Christ. Here on a Sunday, all over the world, under the tree somewhere, in some far-flung land, on another continent, in a hut. Here is the glorious ministry of God the Holy Spirit 
It is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is proclaimed, hearts made new, men and women made right, eyes opened, lives transformed. And if anybody thinks that they have found a more glorious ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, then you will know that they are a fraud. Let's pray together. With unveiled faces, we are being transformed. We praise you for this glorious ministry, and we thank you, our Father, for opening eyes, for making us right with you, our Father in heaven, for changing our hearts. We pray that as we meditate on these truths and this chapter in the weeks that come, that you would show us more and more, more and more, the glory of this ministry that is going on all over the world. We thank you for making us sufficient for it by giving us the gospel. We pray, our Father, that each one of us would have a part in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.